Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Retro Chats. Today, we are joined by Acorn Tintin, uh, creator of Funi. And I guess the simplest way that I'd summarize what Funi is, is it's sort of a platform for multiplayer web games, heavily inspired by OMG Pop, which is a deceased platform for web games, for Flash games back in the day. But yeah, if you want to just start out by giving us a quick introduction to who you are and what Funi is and what your role in Funi is. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. I'm co-founder and CTO of Funi, which um, we made or whatever as like, uh, it was very inspired by OMG Pop and it was inspired by like Neopets and stuff. I made it during like the pandemic and stuff. Um, because there wasn't really a way to play games with a huge audience of people, like I think 50, 60, 100 people, where you don't have to sign up and you can just play with friends or whatever, uh, just online. You know, you have to download games or something, and it was a big hassle. So that's why I made Funi, and I've been doing this software engineer thing for a while now. Yeah, that's that's a good point that OMG Pop was really the as far as casual multiplayer games, that's the lowest barrier to entry that it gets. No account required, free web browser. And I can't even really think of a lot of other even like now in modern times. I mean, I guess we have like what those sorts of party games like Jackbox. It's kind of different though. Um, when did you start building Funi? How many it was just a year ago or so, right? Or... Uh, not a year ago. It's more like two years ago. Two a little years. bit more than that, actually. And um, before I started streaming, I would code every day. No breaks, no weekends. Did, <laughs> did you uh, did you work on it off stream a bit before you started streaming? Or like you? Oh, yeah. Oh, OK. So because I... I've only been streaming for four months. Oh, I didn't even realize. Well, you've just grown so fast on Twitch. It just makes me think that. <laughs> just make me. But right, yeah. I guess when we talk about like, it's hard to help one of my friends has your founder badge or something, and that wasn't even that long ago. Yeah. Wow. So, so what what inspired you to get into the, the Twitch streaming thing? You were working on the game for a good, year and a half before that. Um. Yeah. So I streamed on Twitch a tiny little bit before then, and it was kind of something I wanted to do whenever I left Google or whatever is I wanted to get more into YouTube or Twitch or something. And it was something that I'd always say, you know, like every month or every week or whatever, I'd be like, you know, we need to get, get this out there. got to start streaming. And for a while it was like, oh, we don't want to release too early. What if we get a competitor or something? Because there was this site called uh, backyard, I think they got acquired by Discord, but they were kind of a competitor to us for a while before they got acquired. Um, mm. And so eventually, it ended up just being me. Like I was still afraid, right? I was afraid of maybe like how I would sound or how I would look, or um, would people actually be interested in this? And then finally, I just said, "Okay, I'm just not going to care. Just I'm not going to look at viewer count. I'm not going to." I'm just not going to care. I'll just stream to no one. You know, it'll be fine. Yeah. Do you still not check your viewer count? I still don't check my viewer count. Nice. I also do not check my viewer count ever. I'll check it right, like right before I end stream. I'll check. But no, there's too many, too many ways that that can cause you to stress. <laughs> so, wow. And yeah, you, you, I guess you saw a lot of interest in the project uh, before you started streaming or was that one of the, was streaming one of the main things that, uh, got your early users? The streaming has really increased the audience of the Funi so much so that even in the Funi discord, which isn't really supposed to be my streams discord, I'm supposed to have a separate one. Um, you'll get lots of programming questions and stuff in the general chat now, just because so much of the audience has come from Twitch. Yeah, I know that feeling. I've had a similar sort of experience where you you start out the foundation of a community for the game, and then you rapidly get more people interested in the development of the game than the actual product, or at least in the state that it's currently in, maybe. So you did already have the game released, though, before, before you started streaming. Oh, yeah. Sure. I had it released for quite a while, and we even 
posted it on Reddit. We posted our second game on Reddit. I see. So I guess, well, how many players do you have on Funi, you know, at the moment as of as of late 2022? Is it uncommon for people to just randomly log in and find a lobby or is there is there much of that at all yet? Um, I think we're up to about 100 daily active users, which is still really small, but it's growing. So I'm happy. That is good, though. 100 daily. I mean, that's if it's people in relatively the same time zones, you might get a, a few lobbies today. Do you see are you able to see like how many lobbies people actually create and people engaging and that sort of thing? Um, yeah. So uh, whenever we relaunched a game on Crazy Games, that's when we saw a huge growth. So a lot of the times if you go to Phony, you'll see a game for four in a row. That's like the most popular game right now, mm -hmm. just because it's the only game on Crazy Games or any other game portal site right now. I see. So I didn't even realize that you're doing that. You're taking that your games that you've developed for Funi and also embedding individual games on other browser game portals. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. because you can detect if you're inside of an if you're an embed and then yeah. you can restrict access to certain parts of the site. Yeah, I believe OMG Pop did the same thing. I had actually just kind of forgotten about that. I see. So yeah, so I guess you've had more success I mean, that makes sense. That's probably the smartest way to get your, it's probably a lot easier to get plays that way than just dri driving people to your own site to log in. I mean, how does that work though? They don't, I guess it's just not associated with any account. It's just like playing a regular guest account when you go about it that way, right? Like if someone were to play a game through one of the third party publishers. Yeah, you can still log in, but I'm thinking about just simplifying it even more to where there's it's just like a guest account and there's nothing else really i don't know i have undecided it's nice that it works that way so you just take every single game that you have and individually release them all on just multiple multiple different platforms is that the strategy or is it more complex than that eventually so right now we're working on a mobile client and i'm just using this thing called capacitor js which can you can take like a single page app and you can just use capacitor JS and within like an hour or so you can get like an APK or something. It's actually, it's less time than that, but it takes a little bit of time to install and set stuff up the first time. I see. So are it, you intend to release like on iOS app store and things like that? Yeah. So I intend oh. to release on the Android app store, iOS app store, Steam. Um, and then I'm also going to take all the games and put them as an embed on crazy games and apparently new uh new grounds you mentioned new grounds so. <laughs> yeah that's that's my favorite web portal definitely so oh so were you saying that like you'd release the game separately on on things like the app store or if i or would i be downing like that would i be downloading a funi app or would i just be downloading like 10 different separate game apps on my phone um i'm undecided i think i can just do both I don't think there's any limitation yeah. to that. So I'll just, why not both? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Well, I guess to go back to the, 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 the sort of start of when you started building, uh, Funi, I guess to give us an introduction to the tech stack that you decided to use and why you did, I mean, obviously you wanted it to run in the browser natively because of the whole, uh, low barrier to entry thing. That's like the whole mm -hmm. point of the format. But uh, yeah, how did how did that go? Or was, was there multiple prototypes, or was there a lot of research that had to be done, or you just sort of got going with it and kept at it? <laughs> um, yeah. So Funi is actually the first TypeScript thing I've made, um, oh. and when I was starting out, I didn't really know a lot of the browser technologies, like the modern frameworks and things that people were using. It was looking at like Angular, Vue, and React. And I ended up choosing React. This was like the main thing, right? Um, because it felt more familiar uh, coming from more of like a Java background and because I really liked functional components. And then um, the rest, like Firebase and WebSockets and all that other stuff kind of came a little bit later. Firebase was very early. Like that was kind of decided. TypeScript, React, um, the backend, I wasn't decided on Kubernetes, but I initially tried like the serverless architecture. Um, 
and latency for cold starts was just awful. This was two years ago. Mm. This was before we had access to things like Vercel, um, which has like these way better kinds of um, like Lambda function style things. But you can imagine trying to play a game and having the server have one second latency or half a second latency or more. It wasn't feasible. Yeah, no, I so totally I just... understand. <laughs> trying to run over people in uh, Dynamite and you think that they're trapped inside the balloons and then they're not because it was just <laughs> the latency, the prediction tricking you. Dynamite actually influenced the network stack. I rewrote the network stack because of Dynamite. Oh, interesting. Again. I mean, yeah, that is probably the most action-oriented real-time uh, game on the site. To, to give context for people that aren't familiar, it's a clone of Bomberman, essentially. And OMG Pop also had a clone of Bomberman. And... Uh, Dynamite is very true to the version that OMG Pop has, very true to Balloono, it was called. It does add some extra things on top, I've noticed, or I don't know if all that's implemented yet. I was actually a little bit confused with some, with some of the advanced settings, but that yeah, that is, that is another thing that's really cool about uh, the way that you've made the games for Funi so far, is that they are very true to how they functioned on OMG Pop, but have some extra things. So it's like the, 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 you're really appealing really hard to the people that <laughs> grew up on OMG Pop, but uh, not just being like a, a lifeless, true one-to-one -one clone. Uh, that was kind of the goal, right? Um, it was just, I wanted games to be kind of, to feel similar, but then to be played on a much larger scale, potentially, if people wanted. I wanted it to be flexible to like, uh, the audience, you know, if some people have four friends, some people have eight, some people have a hundred, it shouldn't limit what kind of game you play. Yeah. You were mentioning earlier, uh, I guess the concept of wanting to build something that supports like very large amounts of players. And I know some of the, the max limits for the games are like kind of ridiculously large amounts. And then also kind of cool as well, like for when you for people that are like streamers or people that have communities and want to host events and like paste their link and have a ton of people hop in and that sort of thing but i mean yeah how do, how do you scale that how do you get a hundred people in these games i mean I, I know for like the the connect four clone that you have you have an option where you can or i think for all the games you have like a host versus everyone option maybe you could talk about that a little bit and explain yeah um the host versus everyone option is kind of like the early part of just adding proper team support. So in the back end, I have support for in number of teams, like just any number of them basically. But on the front end, the UI, it's kind of just restricted to like team zero and team one. Uh, so there's like two different teams. Host versus everyone puts the creator of the room or I guess the current host on one team and then everybody else on another team. Mm -hmm. um, so you can do things like that if like if you're a twitch streamer or something where you can play against everybody else but it's probably not implemented in every game uh i know it works for a four in a row and for chess and checkers well checkers isn't out yet but it will work for that and it works for paint job but um i i don't know about the others yeah i was trying it with the with the four in a row and I guess the way that it works, right, is that the host takes their turn and then the other team takes their turn and then everybody on that team, it just cycles through who gets to choose the move. It would be kind of cool if you even had stuff like uh, more like in the Twitch plays Pokemon sort of sense where like voting mechanisms where it's like it takes the majority of people's inputs or something like that. I'd really like hone in on that sort of thing. I mean, so, both options are both concepts are cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Coding Garden actually mentioned this as well. Um, it, it, he mentioned uh, having the whole team like vote on an option, and I think that's just better. So I think y'all are onto something here. Um, gotcha. <laughs> maybe coming soon. Cool, cool. Yeah, no, that's what immediately like. I think a lot of people. I think a lot of people will latch onto that, especially if there's a. If you really like provide a lot of other features and options that benefit people doing stuff with their community like like referral codes and that type of stuff and i don't know i don't know i'm sure you have lots of ideas 
Uh, I'd love to hear the ideas because, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll just write them down and take the best ones. Has uh, has the sort of feedback that you've gotten from your viewers and your community influenced much in the in the four months that you've been streaming? Immensely, uh, like my chat is way smarter than I am. I hear stuff mentioned all the time. Like they'll fix bugs or they'll mention some super really cool technology. Like I had no idea about Vercel or about Planet Scale or about um, many of these other things, uh, and I wouldn't have known about it if it wasn't for chat. That's cool. Yeah, it's uh, I've had a similar experience where, yeah, just having a lot of eyes on something and people providing feedback. It's it's a, one of the, it's the major benefit, I guess, of the sort of open development. I guess the fear is like kind of what you already mentioned earlier, which is, I guess, getting a competitor coming in. <laughs> making a clone and outdoing you but it seems like you've uh you've definitely got the lead if another competitor came in right now you've kind of already got your mvp going i mean at this point it's mostly just about adding more games and more features right you have the, the core loop yeah um <laughs> i just have to figure out how to scale it up and get it out there yeah i mean what what is your main focus at the moment is it is it mostly just about adding more to the games and adding new games and that sort of thing or what is the what is the main push at the moment uh i think the main push is getting it out there it's yeah. getting <laughs> um yeah i mean it it probably needs a better shop experience a better uh system for that and more games doesn't hurt but i need to like it on more platforms and I just have to get the word out there and polish stuff up, I guess, maybe improve registration login. Yeah, there's a, there's already a lot of contents and I like how the shop system works. I mean, it's pretty similar to OMG pop where it's like, there's some, you earn, you earn gold across all games that you play, which can you, you can just buy cosmetic things with, but then there's also certain things you can only spend real money on if i'm not mistaken is there a free way to earn even the premium currency or no no will there ever be no um maybe maybe that could be like um a referral thing maybe if you refer yeah. people you could get premium currency watch a 30 second ad get one gym i'll just sit there watching ads all day long <laughs> it's a very common thing with mobile games oh Especially. i don't want to do ads yeah no i don't blame you I, I like that uh i mean obviously it's a project that you really care about and are really personally interested in and that, and that shows in the fact that it's not spammy and that the microtransactions are very very not intrusive because obviously you were a fan of omg pop back in the day i'm sure you played mm -hmm. it a bunch yeah i just have so many good memories of just like hanging out in a skype call <laughs> just like get off the of school <laughs> it's just like having yeah. that as background you know while you do whatever i remember seeing like as well like youtube videos people would just use it as the background like watching like prank call videos on youtube and they're just playing like the bejeweled clone inside of omg pop is the background like it's not even related to the <laughs> video at all it's just nostalgic is well, there any like play it or whatever like in the background or it would be a wallpaper or, or what was it well it's just like a common sort of format for a youtube video is it's like you're telling a story or it's like a video that's purely like based off of what the person is saying and they'll just have some yeah. random gameplay in the background and omg pop was kind of like a common thing for that because that's just was something that people were always just hanging out on are there are there other plans you have for monetization type of stuff or is the the shop pretty much the extent of it um, I want to do like a VIP membership kind of thing. Maybe you get like extra gold, extra XP. Um, I don't know what other features. I, I've got one, one feature idea in particular that I might be able to do, but we'll see. It depends on if I can figure out the pricing. Gotcha. Is the, is the goal long term for this to, uh, I mean, you focus on it full time, obviously. Are you, are you trying to build this into like a, ideally a business that would just be you know your main thing that supports you um that would be pretty cool either that or twitch or something else i I've got yeah so probably a combination yeah <laughs> you'll probably yeah do you probably get i've i've seen, i've experienced a i think a lot of like uh, game dev streamers experience this sort of thing where it's like they end up 
getting more success off of Twitch subs and that sort of thing than people <laughs> buying their games half the time, or that's been the case for me at least. But uh, yeah, it's I mean it's good to have a a good a good balance as well. It's like you have multiple things going on. It's uh, it's good. It sounds like streaming has been a major benefit to your development so far. So that's all great. Uh, so I guess uh, as far as uh, talking about how your game is influenced by OMG Pop, OMG Pop uh, was canceled. It was shut down by Zynga, who bought it out maybe uh, 10 years ago or so, we, we mentioned earlier. But uh, why do you, do you think about like why OMG Pop possibly didn't succeed and why they possibly didn't want to run it and mess with it anymore? And, uh, you know, you, you anticipate it being a successful product, even though they felt that it couldn't be and they just wanted to shut it down. Why do you think that is? Um, I, I think this is just kind of the way acquisitions and stuff work at companies that are really large. It's probable. I mean, I'm just speculating or guessing at this point, but um, it might have been a lot harder to work quickly, you know, in that kind of yeah. environment. Or I don't know, there could, could be any number of reasons. I know that OMG Pop wanted to buy back the rights or something to OMG Pop at some point, like the former employees, but uh, I guess they weren't able to offer enough or they just Zynga wasn't interested. I don't know. We better pray that Zynga doesn't come off her acorn a million dollars for Funi. It'll be a dark day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would probably be I don't, I think Funny would stay around at a, at a place <laughs> like that. Yeah, it was, it was sort of a awkward times as far as like, uh, like web game development, like in mid 2010s as well. It's sort of a transitionary period. Whereas like in 2022, I feel like the overall consensus is that we're much more, in, we're much more confident in the web as like, as, as a platform for gaming now that we're not relying on things like Flash and Java applets to be able to make games with proper graphics. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually curious, what do you do about people who have their, uh, like, their rendering set to where they don't use the GPU? Or do you uh, do anything? Well, I believe you can still use HTML5 Canvas, even if you don't have that. And I, for my games, I use a renderer that uh, def defaults to, it, it, it prefers... WebGL and then defaults to Canvas 2D. And if I'm mistaken and just neither of them work, then I guess they just don't play my games. <laughs> Fair enough. So you, you mentioned that this was your first project that you had really done stuff in TypeScript. What, was it a like a long, grueling sort of research project to learn about all these browser APIs and the specifics of it? No? No, it was... Um... I wasn't that bad. I, I'm sure, like, I think the hardest thing was just picking the wrong technology and then having to move to something different. I see. How how long have you been a software developer, by the way, before you started Funi? Um, I've been doing software for about 12 to 13 years, I think, at this point. So I recode almost daily. I see. So do you, do you find yourself, uh, have you, have you reached a point where you're so confident in your system architecture that you don't, uh, that you pretty much stand by with most of the ways that you set up the architecture whenever you started the project, or do you still find yourself having to iterate a lot? I still have to iterate a lot. Um, <laughs> there's just so many different parts of being like a software engineer or programmer. Like you're never going to know everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, I, I think it's a really difficult position in particular when you're the person that's the lead of a large scale project. Have, have you had roles like that in the past where you had to work on system architecture type of stuff? I mean, you mentioned that you work on, you worked at Google and have, is there any work experience in particular that's really benefited you as far as building something like this? Um, yeah, at Google, I actually had a relatively small role. I was just doing like performancey stuff. But before I was at Google, I was um, the lead for uh, like a small company, and I had to oh. do like I was responsible for the whole architecture and 
replacing um, like migrating databases from a co-location to the cloud and for designing or deciding like what programming languages we're going to use moving forward and doing a whole bunch of migration stuff. So that really helped. And then my experience before then, where I just worked on my own, making stuff also helped. I see. Did you did you ever make games before this project? Barely. When I was in college, I made a, some games because I had to for class. Um, I don't make a lot of games. I spent most of my time making like websites or desktop apps or other things. That's pretty impressive. There's, I mean, was it was there anything about game development in particular that was a big change for you versus other types of dev? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Game dev requires people that like actually know math, so <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> There's all sorts of things that involve like geometry and trigonometry and other stuff. And that was tough. And all sorts of algorithms that I didn't have to deal with before. I see. Has it, are you sort of like the trial and error type of person to just get in and give it a go? Or did you uh, learn, learn from anyone or some sort of resource? Um, I feel like the best way to learn is to just do. You know, you just make something and you learn as you go. Yeah. Um, I mean, like when you're first getting started and you're really unsure of what direction to take, you know, that's where other sources are useful, like lots of reading and stuff and some videos maybe. But after you get a hold of the basics, actually just making stuff, I think is really, really beneficial. Agreed. Yeah, that's kind of the same. I mean, I guess everybody has their different learning styles, but that's kind of. I've done the same thing. I've had uh, I've had a lot of trial and error because I don't have I didn't really have much experience architecting large systems at all when I started getting into my MMO. I had only been uh, developing it all for just a couple of years, which is why I've scrapped entire code bases multiple times. I find it getting a bit easier over time, but it also doesn't really surprise me that much when you say that like you always kind of still end up having to go change some things. It's not like you're ever truly have it all completely down um so did you like scrap like the entire code base and just start the whole mmo project over or uh i've i've started a new repository at least a couple of times i wouldn't say ditch all the code because i'm not i'm not really ditching the logic for a lot of the features or the way that they work i'm mainly just trying to ditch like the core architecture because I had a bad understanding of how to build core systems properly. Some, some specific stuff that's like the way that I send state updates from the server to the client. I've had really bad impl implementations of that in the past and then had features that relied on it in a poor way to the point where it's like, this is just a whole tangled up mess that I can't really fix. And I feel like those drastic sort of examples uh, that becomes less common for me over time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, same here, always, <laughs> always learning. Do you use some sort of, uh, game library or framework at all within your games? Uh, like for a game like dynamite, for example, it's like very real time and fast pace. I'm sure it requires like a game loop and that, that sort of thing. Do you, do you leverage any tools? Uh, it actually does not use a game loop. Oh. Um, <laughs> so well, never mind then. Yeah, I I use a WebSocket between the client and the server, which is the architecture that I had to switch to because um, I was getting a lot of head of line blocking, which is where you have like lots of packets kind of just this is giant bottleneck of packets slowly getting sent out, and there more packets are coming on than are getting sent out, so then it just gets mm. really sluggish after a while. Yeah, but yeah. I fixed that with the WebSockets. And so then that goes into React. And then I have like a component that doesn't render anything, but has like these use effects that then whenever the state changes, it'll send it out to the actual game, which is object oriented. Um, and that uses like an entity component system, which I'm currently using phaser for a render oh. because I didn't know better at the time. I think Pixie is better. Yeah, Pixie is more of like a less opinionated just renderer or as phaser is trying to provide like 
game specific tools. I, I believe Phaser also uses Pixie within their code base as a as a dependency. Um, I think it uses an old version. Oh, okay. I see. So you're trying to maybe move away from that at some point, or you just deal with it. <laughs> Don't care. <laughs> For now, I'm dealing with it. Um, I want to move to Pixie just because I only really use Phaser for its rendering, mm -hmm. but maybe someday. So you are obviously the lead developer on the project. Do you have any code help though, whatsoever? Um, occasionally. I mean, the chat helps, right? So yeah. that's really, really helpful. Um, we used to have like a developer who was helping out, and we've tried a couple of others, but right now we're running on a like super shoestring budget. So I'm the only one who's really doing a lot of code right now. That makes sense. Um, I'm sure I'm probably not the first person to mention the possibility of collaborating with another dev, just like for a specific game or something, you know, someone else developing a game for Funi. Have you put a lot of thought into that? Um, I would like that. It's really tough because the question is, do you just open source or like give them access to both the server and the client? And do you just give them access to the client and say, go figure out the back end yourself? Um, it's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. I guess if you wanted to make it, if you were, if you wanted it to be fully automated so that anybody could do it, you'd have to like write some sort of package that people could use to like write games that doesn't require them to actually have the source code. But I guess probably more reasonable in the short term would be to just collaborate with a specific person and just allow them to have access. Do you get people asking you like if to do that though and that type of thing or not so much? I do all the time. I think just in the chat right now, uh, we've I've been asked as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could even take it farther. I mean, I've seen other platforms do something similar where they'll host like game jams and you know try to scope out collaborations and in that sort of way. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure a ton of people would. I mean, you can think of it sort of similarly to even like the sites that you post your games on, like or like something like Newgrounds. I mean, your site is essentially just one of those, but with only your own games and they're all multiplayer. <laughs> not too, not too different. Um, so as far as like the the community aspects within the within the website, how much how much I guess what kind of thought have you put into that? There's like friends list features and being able to follow people. Are you hoping to build a sort of like social platform within the website that you think people will actually want to communicate and form groups and stuff? Or is, is that something you've put time into? I haven't put a lot of time into it because I think for most people, they just use Discord. That's yeah. kind of the chat <laughs> method these days. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of other features that I've spent time working on. Yeah, I could even think of something like a guild system, maybe that just allows you to have some sort of grouping between you and all your buddies. Maybe it wouldn't be your communication platform so much, but um, I, I'm I believe you said that you work with others as well for uh, for the graphics and the audio and all that stuff, too. Right. So I just do the code. So I outsource um, the audio, the music, the graphics, the design. I see. And you just fund this game out of pocket, essentially, right? Is Oh, well, I'm co-founder. So a uh, co-founder funds a lot of it. I see. Oh, so do you have like other co-founders that started this project with you? Or were you all alone when you began? A co-founder. Mm -hmm. A co-founder. Oh, okay, cool. Something that I wanted to do when I first started Retro MMO was try and find someone that I could like 50-50 sort of start with just because it's nice to like, <laughs> I don't know, have someone else kind of in the same boat. But after... I don't know, after I took it far enough without finding someone now, it's like, well, I don't know if there's much point in me doing something like that now, <laughs> after I've already built, <laughs> I've already made the prototype practically. So, so back on the topic yeah. of, uh, like future games though, I think ev every game that you have so far is one that's, uh, inspired by OMG pop directly. Do you have any concepts that you have come up with yourself that you really hope to do? Um, I still have a lot of games left that I need to make that are, that people want to see, you yeah. know, like ball racer and, or whatever you want to call it, um, <laughs> some kind of like step mania DDR kind of game. 
Um, oh yeah. Oh, that'd be so want fun. To see Ludo. Um, uh, there's a couple of others. Yeah, there's just so, there's so many. I could see DDR clone being very popular because like Friday Night Funkin' has been so popular, really popular browser rhythm game. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I'm I, I'm guessing your sort of target audience right now is mostly people that have nostalgia for OMG Pop, but it'll be interesting to see if it, like actual like kids start getting really into it. Or maybe you've already. I don't know if you have demographics on that sort of thing, but like that's how it really I think take off. <laughs> I don't know what it is that they want. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that they probably like it as is. It's just a matter of if the marketing pans out that way. But that is, that is, that's the most of the people you probably hear from, right? Is people that mm. already were familiar with OMG Pop and are kind of looking for... That's, that's kind of how it was for me with Retro MMO, where it's like people that grew up playing Dragon Quest or whatever. But then after posting it on some of the web portals and things, here and there you'll get like teenage kids that are like oh wow this is interesting and they're like discovering the game and don't even know that like there's already been a million games <laughs> with these mechanics it looks really good like you, i'm shocked i thought you would have been working on this game with lots of other people well i have a lot of i have a lot of one-off help i'm only i'm like the sole owner and i don't have any employees mm -hmm. but uh, obviously all the graphics and audio or commissions and i've had a lot of people actually uh, just like want to contribute code for free and just like put in pull requests which is kind of sketchy I guess but I don't know if people are begging me to help out for free I, I'm not really gonna say I'm not really gonna say no I don't know maybe I should maybe I should have said no <laughs> but yeah I've had a lot of volunteer help there's actually there's actually one programmer that I do uh contract hourly to do just a little bit but I mean my budget is uh my budget is pretty low <laughs> So then, uh, do you open source like the client and server? I don't open source uh, anything. No, the people that volunteer oh, to help, okay. they're just given specific access. That's why I feel weird about it is because for an open source project, it's normalized to contribute for free because it's like you're publicly credited mm -hmm. and you still maintain rights to your code. But people that help me on Retro MMO sign something that attributes their contributions to me, they're actually just donating me code. It's like, <laughs> and that's how I view it. You know, that's how I view like if someone donates me a hundred dollars. Someone donates me a pull request. I think of it as the same. And I just really hope that, you know, I just make it very clear when people are asking about helping, like, Hey, you're just donating to me. If this isn't worth your time, don't do it. But if people want to, I would kind of expect, I'd be surprised if people haven't offered something similar to you. Maybe have, has that happened? I think they have, but I need to get like approval from like the co-founder as well because we're in it like 50 50. Um, so me alone, I don't have majority. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I and um, I want to be careful about like any kind of um, you know, lawyer use legalese or whatever kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I totally understand. I am not a lawyer and i can't afford a can't afford a lawyer therefore my document is maybe not the greatest legally sound protecting me document of all time and i guess i'm taking a little bit of a risk a ri little bit of a risk <laughs> in that sense just sort of trusting people but i think i mean the way that i think about it is if my entire source code got leaked would that really result in anything that negative for me i mean maybe someone would steal it and make a private server or try to make their own game. I just, I don't know. I couldn't see any of that actually really, really burning me too bad. I've also seen people clone my game, you know, without having my source code, just cloning it fast because it's a pretty simple game and they use something, a game engine that makes it be faster. And then like, I don't know, like find security vulnerabilities because the code is leaked and that sort of thing. I mean... Yeah, I don't know. Please find them. I need to know about them. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, part of that is that I don't have a lot of users right now. So, like, having an outage is not the end of the world. I, like, I, I definitely, you said, what, you have 100 daily users? I don't have 100 daily users right now. I have in the past, but, you know, I've been rebuilding my code base for a year. So, I haven't been releasing a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, I guess you just have to <laughs> be a little bit more careful the more more popular and the more users
you get and then also yeah if you have like you're talking you have co-founders who you don't want to screw them over if i screw myself over you know then i'm just mad at myself that's okay <laughs> oh, i lost my train of thought totally oh yeah i wanted to ask you about the the user generated content because uh i didn't really dive into it so much but it seemed like you had stuff you could do like custom maps and dynamite and maybe other sorts of stuff and that would be something unique from omg pop that's like a huge iteration so if, yeah if you maybe like to talk about that sort of thing yeah so phony actually supports a workshop system similar to steam but not as advanced as steam and coded way way worse uh but it works kind of sometimes when it works you know uh so you can make your own maps on dynamite for example which uses tiled um oh, and nice. i like that because i didn't have to go build my own system for people creating maps and contributing them they just use tiled i have like a document that shows people how to do it which is very hard to find and definitely not on the website i need to fix that but people can make their own maps for dynamite so you can have it however you want which is pretty cool and you can also do it for paint job or yeah paint job people can upload their own word lists that's amazing paint job is a game that's like scribble or something yeah yeah draw my thing <laughs> back in the day <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah oh man i need to make a i need to make a dynamite map it uses tiled i use tiled for my games as well. I interviewed him actually. He was one of the previous the previous guests, Bjorn. That's super cool. So I think yeah, I really what I really like about that sort of thing is that's where you really get into like the infinite replayability of these sorts of games is when like when you just think about how many games there have been that have been released as single player games that never got an expansion but continue to have thriving communities to this day because of the user generated content. Is is there like a lot of other plans you have for that? For other games? Um, yeah, so when I make Ball Racer, which or the game inspired by Ball Racer, which I think we're going to call <laughs> Ball Racer or something, um, we plan on having support for maps that are custom as well. I need to figure out how I want to handle that. If I want people to just like draw the map with their finger or whatever, or if I want it to be more like just using tiled again, I'm not sure, but definitely that's going to be a workshop kind of thing. Yeah, I wonder if there's some sort of way that you could incentivize people to do this sort of thing further, like further than just like the satisfaction out of it. if you could like somehow earn something by uh, making stuff that people want to use. I don't know. Has there been any talk of something like that? Um, I mean, it depends like monetary incentiv incentivization. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just there's so, so many things that, gets that complex, I don't have yeah. experience in. That could be really hard. I think like taxes and all sorts of things. Yeah, even just um, something like experience though in the game or like on. I know. think you. I think you can tip people. I think like let me let me. So if I go to the workshop, I think I can see who it's oh. by. Right click. Uh, jokes you can't, but you can see who it's oh. by, which is pretty <laughs> cool, I guess. You were saying to like tip them. Oh, I thought you meant like tip them gold. I thought you were. Yeah, like you a... can tip people gold when you're playing with them. So if you're playing oh, with like a streamer, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can, you might get like a whole. You can ask your audience for tips and then just get spammed a whole bunch of gold or something. Yeah, that's that's the type of thing that. Oh man, I feel really nostalgic, especially for like the, like the YouTubers that used to make videos playing OMG Pop games, and they'd post their referral code on Twitter, and then you'd see them like playing. OMG pop on their stream and they're like level a million because just so many people not level a million but so many people have clicked their referral link it's like i just want to reap all the benefits of people giving me free stuff in Funi and being the coolest guy on Funi. that's all i ever wanted <laughs> how does the referral thing work is it like they get a percent of the xp or it just like a one-time bonus kind of thing I'm not sure it was yeah it was either like they play enough if they cross a threshold of doing enough things you get some experience I, I don't think it was like a lifetime experience split I, th I think it was more of like a one-off sort of thing or maybe if they spent money that gave you something as well yeah yeah but even just the experience gain is like I think would incentivize people to 
do that sort of thing for sure. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could remember exactly how it functioned. It, how so as far like as far as trying to mimic things the way that they worked on OMG Pop, how do you do that? Do you just go look back at old videos of the website? <laughs> uh, well, as you can imagine, that's kind of hard because it's YouTube was barely around <laughs> yeah. at the time OMG Pop was. <laughs> Um, so finding the kind of documentation that's that old is extremely difficult. I think Rocker actually helps. Uh, that's a person who like was in my channel a lot early, and they posted some helpful uh, images or whatever of a couple games. But I guess just you know the community is really beneficial here. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you've just done all the balancing yourself as far as like experience rates and rewards and that type of stuff. Have you just sort of felt it out? Do you have any automated tools that help you balance? Um, so I initially based it off of RuneScape's XP curve and then I adjusted it because it didn't feel right, but it's just automatic in that sense. I need to redo the items stuff because um, the item drops don't feel great right now. It's too low or too like not random enough. So that's an, an area I need to improve. Well, the fact that you did it based off of RuneScape shows that people will never get level cap is one thing. <laughs> this and... is true. There's act I think the level cap is 250. You're not going to get there. Jeez. I guess you don't want people to get there, though. You want it to be a endless climb. Do you, is there plans to have like a lot more types of different rewards for actually leveling rather than just because right now it's mostly just like the gold gain type of thing yeah oh yeah like i'm gonna this was supposed to be done a while back i think i don't know maybe this is done maybe there's a pull request waiting for me or maybe i just need to go in and implement <laughs> this i don't know but yes um i need to get a couple of games i need to just get the cosmetics done and then i need to go in and add them as level rewards uh, I've planned this from the time I began the level reward system. So I can go in and even if you've already claimed a reward for a particular level, I can retroactively add extra rewards for those levels and you can claim the new rewards as I add them. Nice, nice, yeah. That'll definitely get people wanting to grind. I mean, I think the way that most people are going to treat this or how I would treat it at least is just, a little, just play a little bit each day or here and there that's especially if we're talking about there's like some sort of actual like daily incentive or like something you can only do once a day because man it's like the perfect break from coding <laughs> what i normally do when i would need a break from coding is just like go play type racer or something or just like play <laughs> small platformer game i made it's really short the type racer that's another game i wanted to eventually make i saw monkey type which was amazing um but maybe i can make something that's way more basic and way less amazing um on phony oh did omg pop have like a type racer type of game i didn't even yeah. realize yeah, that. Yeah, oh. yeah omg pop had a, a type racing game it wasn't very popular but they had one <laughs> man i remember there was some omg pop game i played a ton I cannot remember for the life of me it was some sort of like timing thing or like some sort of like like platforming or like almost like flappy bird type of thing there was random power-ups and one of them was like a screamer it would put like this scary like black and white like flashing image on the screen it was like the power-ups were things that were like m supposed to mess up the other players who screwed them over wait this so this was on um gpop was it like a flying yeah. pig game oh yeah yeah that one i've played this one <laughs> yeah i need some flying pig action on uh on Funi, but maybe without the screamer, because that shit was scary as a thirteen-year-old. That was the main thing <laughs> making me maybe not want to play it. But now, <laughs> now it's so memorable. I guess because it scared me so good. So, I, I, you said you hadn't done game dev before you you were working on Funi, but uh, I was wondering if now that you've worked on games for Funi, has that made you more interested in making games? Just outside of Funi as like you know a Steam release or just a random something <laughs> later down the um, line. So I I do remember I did do one game. Um, I made like 
kind of the Java based MMORPG, like super duper basic. I just got like the core concepts down and then I, I scrapped it because I had to get, I got to the point where I had to add content and I was like, oh, gee, I didn't think of this. So then I stopped. Um, but no, this is not made me want to really make a whole bunch of games. In fact, it's made me want to do all my other stuff. So I want to do all of my other project ideas because as I've been doing the, the Twitch thing, I keep coming up with new ideas and I don't have time to work on them or implement all of them. I see. So you, ha you have a lot of other projects that are just not related to games at all that you're interested in, mm -hmm. in doing. I see. So are you, are you hoping that there comes a time where you don't really have to work on Foonie so much and it sort of just like runs itself to some degree? <laughs> um, I mean, I do this for fun, but it would be cool if it ran itself, I guess. I don't know. I still enjoy working on it a whole lot. Yeah. I mean, there, there reaches a point where the you have pretty much all the core features. And then especially if you've gotten into some sort of arrangement with other people being able to make games for it too it's like how much do you really need to do at that point but yeah you probably don't want to ditch it entirely anytime soon i'm sure you're pretty passionate about the project well, that's cool any particular ideas that you're uh well you probably keeping your ideas secret that you haven't started building right because you're scared people are going to steal them is that the case no, I actually, um, I mentioned them on stream. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I, I figure if one's going to try building it, that's fine. But I might still build it. Yeah. Um, so like one example is on Twitch, for example, I want people to be able to create polls and questions and stuff. Um, so whether that's for my personal stream or for Foonie in general, um, think of it kind of like subreddits i guess where people can make uh polls and questions and then other people in the community can upvote and downvote those polls and stuff and i'll know what people are interested in and what they want me to do so something like that it's kind of uh, inspired by this really old thing which is used internally at google still uh, back when i was there but it was this really old thing called uh, Google, uh, I forget what that's called, but they used it for kinds of like um, interviews or other stuff. Yeah, Dory. Yeah, that thing. I don't know how Dory. you know the name of it, but yes, that <laughs> one. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I've that's pretty much everything I prepared to ask you about about Funi. Is there really anything particular that you find really interesting about Funi that I maybe didn't think to ask you about? Um. Let's see, there's high scores, achievements, there's items. Oh, I actually did. I, I was kind of curious about the achievements. <laughs> I forgot okay. about that. I noticed them. I noticed them when I was playing, but I didn't, I couldn't find where to look at them or like see where they're tracked. I need to find a better way of showing like the high scores and achievements and items and workshop. Um, but yeah, achievements are, I, I just implemented an achievement system. And you, when you get an achievement, you can get some amount of experience or gold or items. But I try to make achievements meaningful because I see a lot of times in games, you've got these achievements where it's like, um, play five games. Yay, play 10 games. Woohoo, play 25 games. And it's not particularly interesting. So I prefer having them be a little bit more exciting where it's like, beat a uh you know 49 or 50 bots on expert or something that's difficult and hard to do or unique in in other ways yeah yeah no i i agree i appreciate when games have achievements that are actually unique standalone things and not just copy paste do this x amount of times i mean there can be a whole different system for that really if, if people mm -hmm. just really really wanted it so Okay, yeah, sorry to cut you off. But yeah, is there anything in particular about Funi that you wanted to share that I didn't think to ask you about? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see, there was also at one point, um, there was voice and video inside of chat. So mm. you could turn your webcam on, but oh. <laughs> I felt like that was a little distracting for Twitch streamers and stuff because, <laughs> it's, you know, you can imagine you share a room and people start randomly talking in your stream and you're just like, oh, no. 
yeah you can maybe have it if it's just not on by default yeah That's so funny. i need to revisit it at some point but i use amazon chime for that or used amazon chime i deleted the code but it's in github history so i just easily get right it right right well uh what kind of game what kind of games do you like what kind of games are just your favorites of all time Oh, I love MMORPGs. I've played so many, but my favorite game of all time, Final Fantasy X, Majora's Mask is another classic. Um, you know, then you've got like the MMOs, you've got Old School RuneScape, you've got um, Vanilla WoW, um, Burning Crusade was also really great. Waddle Kid was also really great. Um, then let's see, what else? Oh gosh. I played a little bit of EverQuest 2. It wasn't my favorite, though. <laughs> That's so funny what you were saying about that you prototyped the MMO in Java, and then you realized that you had to make content. I've heard that exact same anecdote so many times that that that's when people lose interest or like drop off of an MMO <laughs> project. It's just an <laughs> extremely daunting amount of content needed. <laughs> well, that was a yeah, lot of... This... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh. And this was like before I learned about just outsourcing the things that you're not great at. Yeah. So you just you pay other people to that who are great at something to do the thing that they're great at, and then you focus on what you're good at. Yeah, agreed. And when when you, as well <laughs> as much as you can, it's hard when you're getting started sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I've uh, I've been lucky to have a lot of people be. Pretty generous with the contributions, the arrangements. Yeah, I, I saw on your Twitch, like, I was blown away. I was like, oh, my goodness. I'm talking to someone famous here. This is crazy. Oh, <laughs> oh I wasn't even talking about, like, the donations. I just meant more like the fact that people give oh. me ridiculous low rates for really quality work. Oh, yeah, no, people are very generous with the, with the support of the game, too, especially when I was doing it full time. Wow people really stepped up because they, I mean, and I'm transparent about like how, how much money the game makes and how much mm -hmm. it costs to run and all that. So I guess that maybe incentivizes some people. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm super lucky. Like, I don't know where, I don't know where retro MMO would be now if not for all that. It'd have a hell of a lot less graphics than it does now <laughs> if without that money, but yeah, I, I mean, I kind of do the same. Obviously, I, I, I enjoy I enjoy content development to some degree and that sort of thing. But I've had some help with that, too. And I don't think I want to be the only one doing content development because, uh, I mean, like like I was saying before, it's a lot <laughs> for MMO. Uh, well, yeah, that was a lot of really interesting stuff about Foonie. Very insightful. Um, I love the site. I'll keep using it. Big fan of it. Excited to see where it's going. And yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us. Thanks everybody who showed up live. Um, thank you, of course, to Covalence, the sponsor of this podcast, which is also happens to be the school that I went to to start my programming journey. What's four years in it, four years ago? <laughs> yeah, thank you. This was really great. Thank you so much, Acorn. And I guess we'll call it here. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me on.